Hello, welcome to Think Tech. I'm Crystal here on Quack Talk, still in Hong Kong. And I am very excited to share this conversation with you today um, to talk about anti-Blackness from an Asian perspective. You know, we talk about racism and anti-Blackness in the States. It's a very contentious topic and it's a very Black and white binary, as you all know, and we're trying to break through those boundaries. But how about resituating our lens to Asia to see Asia as the center of perspective to unpack the way colonialism has affected um, certain countries and how those residues of post-colonialism have impacted the way we live in our lens against people of color in Asia. So let's talk about that with my wonderful guest, the founder of the Africa Center in Hong Kong, Innocent Mutanga. Welcome, Innocent. Thank you. So happy to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. Thank you. And I, I love talking to you about this stuff because we can go all over the place. And, you know, we're going to try to unpack, you know, micro and macro perspectives on race and racism because sometimes it's those small stories that really impact. I remember actually a few years ago, we did this really, the radio interview with you and you were talking about one of your favorite foods. Do you remember that interview? Yeah, yeah. Talking about your childhood? Yep, yep. Uh, okra, you know, okra soup, uh, which is uh, very, very delicious. Uh, dish, uh, you know, that I grew up uh, doing, you know, also going to the bushes and gathering up by myself. Um, so it's been a, it was a hobby growing up. So, you know, I'm, I, I cannot forget one of my favorite foods because I still enjoy it up to today. <laughs> yeah, see, it's so specific. And, you know, memories are so tied to culture and associations with everything. So um, that's a great way to start. So um, give us a little more background about um, where, what type of a, a place you grew up in and how and why you came to Hong Kong first? Yeah, I mean, I was born uh, and raised in Zimbabwe, you know, before coming to Hong Kong about 10 years ago. Um, and while I was in Zimbabwe, I think, you know, my childhood is defined by two places. One was a rural uh, countryside, uh, and then the other part was a coal mining town. Um, so in the rural side of things, that's where, you know, I was kind of going around, you know, finding all the different fruits in the forest, um, you know, finding this uh, so-called bush okra, I think the Egyptians call it Molokai uh, as well, you know, and, um, you know, and heading goats and cattle, um, you know, that was fun. You know, that was a very, come, a very interesting coming of age, um, you know, experience where being a man, I remember it meant that you had to go through gruesome experience, you know, having wasp it by two, you, you know, having to go through some of these very, very, painful experiences, you know, uh, from becoming. That's funny from you call that a coming of age of being stung by a wasp. <laughs> you know, the stereotype of maybe some coming of ages from certain countries would be something more like some challenge of go throwing you into the jungle and having you survive for a few days on your own type of thing. But gee, that was like your normal life growing up. Yeah, it was, it was a thing for us. Coming of age was not an event. It's a, uh, it's a, it's gradual, you know, you don't, you know, which actually makes more sense than just saying one day, you know, two days, then you kind of age, but it was more like gradual, um, you know, where you can have to go through this, you know, and there is second chances, you know, if you fail, you know, you're going to get more, uh, you know, uh, stung by more wasp, you know, um, so there was kind right. of picked of it. So that, that was kind of like my experience, at least within the rural areas. And then the mining town, I always tell people like, I know almost everything about coal. You know, because that's where I grew up, you know, in as part of me, you know, that's how I grew up. Uh, and uh, tell us something about coal because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> you know, nowadays, of course, people talk about coal as an, an unclean form of energy. Um, you know, but when I was growing up, I wasn't thinking it in that way. For me, it was just a source of income for 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 all the miners that were working in there. Um, you know, of course, when I look back, I realize sometimes even the way the houses were arranged, you know, going back to colonialism and apartheid, uh, the houses were arranged. The Europeans were, were usually their house in the eastern side, and then the, the Africans on the western side. So the dust, the coal dust was going to the western side. Uh, so a lot of people, actually miners, were dying uh, because of TB and other different issues around uh, coal dust. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm only understanding those things when I go older, like, damn, this was just not the best way this town was planned. So town planning was planned in a very, very weird way. All these toxic gases, you know, go to the, uh, the African population, while it's the European populations, very nice, um, you know, right. 
side of things as well. So that was kind of like, you know, um, you know, so dust was core dust was just the normal aspect of life, you know, growing that's up. That's like such a good metaphor. You know, I'm thinking about the U.S. and the kind of the segregating, not on a legal term, but even today in the more subtle ways of redlining, you know, where houses for the disenfranchised are always in these certain kind of communities where they just lack resources, right? The water is dirtier. They have less trees, so it's hotter. Um, and, and they're just all these trickling residues of these ongoing racial structures. And it's the same in Africa. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, it's um, and a lot of these are still are still there. You know, yes, you know, there may not be so much European versus the Africans, but now it's a class issue now. You know, where the wealthier ones kind of sort of like con continued. You know, of course, moved to the other side, just where the Europeans were. So these things are, are very much there. So it wasn't just polluting. You know, it wasn't bad for the health. You know, the water. You know, a lot of these things were also being uh, impacted as well. That you know, if somebody actually could do a very good study uh, on the impacts and the effects of this, uh, you know, because a lot of people, the mind has died so young, uh, and that was just normal for for for, for people like, oh yeah, you know, you remind that this is the life you chose. But now I think, of, but now it's actually problematic that people have to die so young because you know they you know they had to go through these. They don't have the best protection and stuff like that. Right. And people don't challenge, people don't question, or the ones who want to question and challenge don't have the voice or the platform. Right. So were you um, always around your own people? Like, was it mostly people, Africans? Um, were there white people or white Africans who were in your area? Did you have, like, what was your first experience of so-called racism growing up that affected it's, you? Um, it was multicultural and multiracial. Um, I know community, you know, uh, you know, of course the people around me were Africans, but not necessarily Africans from uh, Zimbabwe. It was also African, Zambia, Malawi, and a lot of this was being a mining. And that's a very good point because, you know, you, we had that talk at our, the Africa center with my students and, so, you know, sometimes their questions were, oh, so give me a little culture, an example of a cultural uh, something, but we tend to think of Africa as this whole monolith, kind of like Asia. Like I have this issue with Asian American. There's so many things. So you see the class we had, which was wonderful experience for doing, um, talking about culture and introducing them to African culture. And you were trying in your very short time to be able to explain that every country in Africa has their own very unique thing, which is um, something we don't learn, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's uh, it's a thing. Like you know, for a lot of people, it's like, oh, Africa is a giant village with the same culture. You know, um, and um, you know, sometimes even just a picture of showing the coastal aspect of Africa, just the coast, it blows people's minds, especially here in Asia, where people are like, wow. So you guys have oceans. You got. I'm like, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. So it actually changes people's minds just to show a picture. It's actually fascinating how people's uh, stereotypes sometimes can fall off uh, after just being exposed to various input things that I would usually take for granted, you know, um, like just show them a picture of your house and then they are going to, it's going to change a lot because these people are already imagining that you're running around with the animals without clothes, you know, so just showing that it already kind of have an, a positive impact in terms of how they perceive uh, the continent and its people as well. Um, Is that one of the efforts you have with the Africa Center? When you talk about rebranding Africa, tell us about that. Yeah, so basically that's one of the aspects we do. So, you know, rebranding Africa, rebranding blackness, um, you know, because you've got people who uh, have these perceptions which have kind of formed, um, you know, through all this negative history, you know, that have portrayed Africa in a negative way, you know, slavery, colonialism, apartheid. Um, and now, you know, the charity discourse, you know, which is kind of portraying these Africans as this, Kids with flies on their uh, on their nose who can who are so little that they can't even kick their fly out, you know. So so the the continuation it didn't end with colonial. This charity discourse is also playing the same uh, onto the same narrative as well. These vulnerable Africans, um, you know, who aren't very smart, you know, and who are quite lazy in some way, you know. So so we we the challenge is to challenge those those perceptions and uh, you know have people have actual representations, not just positive. You know, one people feel complete and full because we're not here to manipulate people like God. You know, we have problems. We also have good things, you know, as like any society. So, so we, you know, we figure out, you know, when it comes to blackness or Africa as a whole, it's not a matter of, oh, we are inferior. You know, it's about, you know, we have the fundamental value. We have all these things, just a perception issue. 
Uh, yeah. you know, so we're not saying let's industrialize Africa or anything like that. We're saying let's rebrand because people have the negative ways of looking at Africa. Um, but and how do you bring the people in to, you know, you can rebrand to your own small little community or contacts, but how do we really make the impact to change and disrupt this way of thinking about so, so what we're doing is to, um, as much as we do directly with the people, um, you know, more tactical, we talk to the schools, we talk to students, we do this media conversations. Um, that's one thing. But also on the strategic point, you know, we're going through like curriculum adjustments, for example, you know, talking, for example, the education bureau, uh, you know, talking with the people who are in positions of making that larger impact that they can incorporate, um, you know, content that's African, they can, um, you know, they can change some content. Because when I look at some of these books that were being used in Hong Kong, you know, I remember this one that was talking about the wind of charity, you know, where there were these people in Africa who were living in a house that was leaking. And then he had some organization with some girl somewhere had a charity thing to bring over to save the day. You know, I'm like, okay, this people Yeah, have white some... saviorism. Yeah, so 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 that so we had to kind of like no, we we have the conversation with the people, uh, with the school or the education people, like guys. Yeah. This book I don't think is good. So and then we adjust. So that's more like on a strategic point of view, um, right. you know, so that every child, um, in the future would have actually have a a, a more accurate, um, you know, perception of Africa, yeah. or they can to actually get their own view. I, I think we need this also in the United States. I mean, you know, Hawaii where I'm based is really a little bit, a little, well, I mean, it's all comparative and it's all a spectrum, right? I mean, racism does exist in Hawaii, even though people think, oh, it's not, it's such it's a beautiful paradise, but it does. So the ideas of racism that are inbuilt into the structures, and to your point is the education systems, where are we lacking in the ways to um, unlearn certain things. You know, I think that's a, a lot of work to do. And you recently had an opportunity to go to the U.S. to do this leadership program. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what that impression was for you um, about the U.S. being there and and kind of um, comparing, I guess, the anti-Blackness in Asia with that in the United States? Yeah, so uh, I joined a program called the IBOP, it's an international leadership program. This is a very premier um, you know, exchange program by the State Department. Um, you know, just been there since 1940. Uh, so it's a fascinating experience, a fascinating opportunity that I was uh, very proud and happy to be part of. Um, so as part of this, you know, we kind of went to different uh, states and cities, uh, you know, learning about, uh, you know, my, my topic was on racial and social justice, uh, you know, learning about the efforts, you know, the problem itself first, and then the efforts that people are doing to address, uh, to address the issue. Um, you know, I think um, the issue is very complex in the U.S. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, of course, from being from our side, initially, you kind of, I kind of think of it like, okay, this is the U.S. race problem. But once I'm in, and then from state to state, city to city, uh, county, county levels, and all these different things, I see all these different ways how people are addressing the issues, as well as how people, how the actual the problem manifests. It was manifesting in terms of housing. For example, I go to some other places. Gentrification is a huge, um, huge, huge problem. Um, in a way, I remember uh, at some point, you know, in Harlem, you know, I was talking to some of the organizations there that usually when they are uh, selling some of these houses to um, white Americans, uh, you know, there will be the idea that, oh, no, you can come here, stay in Harlem, you know, five years down the line or three years down the line, all these black neighbors will be gone, you know. Uh, and then some of the uh, European Americans end up say, or end up living in Harlem because they figure out five years down the line the black people are still there. Um, but of course, on the overall aspects that actually there's been less and less, um, you know, African Americans in 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 Harlem uh, as it was. So there's a lot more gentrification, um, you know, that we're seeing. Um, and then, um, how were you perceived? Did you have any encounters of feeling othered by people in America or fascinated? or, you know, so by your difference. The perception, I think one thing that I enjoyed first is that I feel like, oh my goodness, finally I can just um, mix among the black people and now we are many, you know, um, I enjoy that. Because in Hong Kong, um, you know, usually you're kind of like the other almost every oh, single wait. second. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there is no point of solidarity with somebody else 
you know, you know, you get on the subway in Hong Kong, nobody sits next to you, or they stand up. You know, not sitting is one thing, but standing up when you sit down, that's a problem. That's even worse. You know, um, and then you can kind of have this kind of, you know, it's 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 you know, it's 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 this microaggression that you see a lot more in Hong Kong. Yeah, that are yeah. problem. Uh, so on one hand, you feel more welcome because there's, you know, there's a community of different people of color that come together in some kind of commonality. Um, and yet sometimes you can say you treat, would you say you, you have more, um, what is it? Do you have more power or at least voice here because you're not swimming around with so many of your like-minded people and you can do more because of that, would you say? I think there's that partly. But I think the other thing that I don't have much power on is that if you're not many, um, one negative thing you do, one negative thing one of you does, mm -hmm. you know it's going to stick around in the people, the minds of the dominant group. And it's um, so there is no opportunity or privilege to be bad uh, here. One white guy does something bad here in Hong Kong, nobody's going to be running away from white people, okay? But one leg guy does something bad, you know we are going to suffer for the next six months. You know, one leg guy goes to a shop, shop leave. You know, each time I go to any shop, I'm going to be watched very, very closely. That's but it. the way being watched, don't you think it's a little bit different? So the U.S., that watch, that surveillance, that subtle kind of, or not so subtle type of racism comes embedded by, based on the foundation the country was built on, right? The, 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 yeah. the legacy of slavery. But in Hong Kong, it's different. Um, there is, I think, to some extent, to give, you know, Asians the benefit of the doubt, sometimes it's just pure curiosity, right? Yeah, so I don't really, where do you draw the line? I think the idea of being washed in this context is that it's not, this one is not curious. This one is absolute fear that, uh, that this particular person uh, might do this harmful thing. You know, but curiosity is there uh, overall, you know, which, um, you know, but that's more like on the, you know, on the street, on the day to day, people want to learn, right? So you kind of have people who are cautious and people who are curious. And sometimes it happens at the same time. Um, you know, this is something that you would, um, you know, uh, you would sort of also experience. But on the other hand, I think um, there is quickness to judge. That's, that's what I'm trying to get to within the Asian context, especially Hong Kong and greater China overall. There is like quickness to judge based on one little thing, it can paint a whole negative image. Um, so I think it's, you know, that one also manifests on a good way that based on this, you know, sometimes you just show one picture, it undo all the negative imagination that they, they, they had. So I feel like, um, I think people make judgments quickly here. Um, you know, um, there's a the too. You know, yeah. there's that whole uh, respectability politics. You know, just because you have a suit on and you're educated at Harvard and you walk in the street, if you're a black man, you'll still be a target. You know, so the the color of your skin is so deeply ingrained and associated with racism that I don't know. And on a global scale, that when we say we need to re-educate, we need to rebrand. How do we even yeah. move and break those boundaries? It's a uh, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing here. If you're wearing your suit on. People are more likely to respect you. That's true. Uh, um, they're gonna think like, "Oh yeah, he's making more money." You know, therefore, yeah. I, I gotta. So, so there's a very classist. Uh, well, the class issue actually plays in more. It plays in, I think, a little bit more. Uh, but there is an intersection of it. Um, you know, there is an association that uh, darker skin uh, means low economically. So, so you want necessarily given the benefit of the doubt that. Oh, even if you're darker, you might potentially be on the upper side of the of the things. The initial assumption is that you're darker, you are lower class. And then right, when they right. when, Chinese, when, Asians too. Yeah. When they see something else, they're like, oh, okay. Oh, hi, out in, out in, out in. You know, <laughs> yeah, money, that's it. Yeah, right, so you right. money. You know, so, but that's the impression of again class and hierarchy of like privilege of climbing up the social ladder. The idea of success always is associated with wealth, which is kind of sad too. And we're you know part of rebranding, I think, comes from the cultural aspect. And I want to bring it back to our event at the Africa Center last week when I brought my students over to your um, your center. And one of the most brilliant things I thought was by introducing the different cultures on the African continent through music. So what you did was you had 
like, okay, so Northern, and even then it was quite generalized, but still, you had chunks of the continent. Northern Africa has what kind of um, music? What are the moves different? How is it different from like the Southern Africans in the East and the West? Um, I have a short clip of this one of um, a, a drumming session where he does this. Maybe we can take a quick look and then we come back to it. What's his name again? That's Ronald. That's Ronald Babu. So it's brilliant that they he brought out all the different African instruments and he's playing and he's getting the students to um, come and enjoy and embrace. And again, this whole sense of circular gathering is a very important mm -hmm. energy that um, I think a lot of times when we think of education, we think of these kind of very static seats with the teacher in front and the students, you know, and I feel like this really brings an energy together to 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 embrace uh, a certain experience. So do you want yeah. to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, I think one of the important things we try to do with these programs is for people to learn both the tangible and the intangible aspect of the culture. Um, there is always a tendency to stick on the material side of the culture, like, oh yeah, you guys have uh, these beads, uh, you guys, uh, you know, uh, wearing this kind of clothes. That's all beautiful. But I think with music, for example, we're teaching them the concept of like, you know, how in African culture, um, you know, you can be different, uh, but together it doesn't preclude you from forming harmony, even with all the differences. You can uh, encourage all those aspects of it. And then through music, people are learning all these uh, beautiful aspects of the culture, um, you know, which, um, you know, are not always easy. You can't teach that by saying, oh yeah, you know, this is the clothes we wear, this is, which are all great things to do, you know. So it, so we, if we try to kind of get the kids to 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 realize that as Africans, we're not just dancing beings, you know, but there is a, a, a thought process behind it. There's a philosophical aspect to it. Because that's not something that people initially associate with blackness. You know, they, you know, um, you know, yeah, they can think about, you know, Nietzsche and all the different guys, you know, and then, the, you know, you know, when they think about, oh, you know, how did the Europeans think about what does it mean to be human? Oh, I think therefore I am. But what about the Africans? You know, I am, you know, I am because you are, you know, all these aspects of understanding what does it mean to be human, how the culture, how the people actually, um, you know, relate and interact. So these are kind of like important things to try to bring out as well. Right. So talking about learning culture through music and just different aspects and just exposing. And I think it's, it goes back to resituating the lens. How do we... Um, change our perception of something if we don't know that there is a different angle to it, right? And I always think about that in terms of everything we apply to. And we're not going to be able to break boundaries unless we do recognize the, the trapping of the certain framing that we're based in, right? So, yeah. you know, if you're in the U.S. and you've never traveled out to Africa and you all you see are these media examples of what Africans look like, then, or, or in Asia, you're going to get what... <laughs> that really, really surface, unfortunately, stereotypical aspect. So changing things is, is harder than absorbing what we have, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. I think, I think one of the things we try to do is make sure people have a full experience of things. It's the five senses, right? You know, they have a thick experience uh, of their experience. Yeah. Where you eat, you know, your tongue. You know, because one of the reasons why people end up with stereotypes is because they are just relying so much on one sense. They actually yeah. did some, they, they saw something, yeah. but uh, because it was not, the context was not full, you know, they have formulated an understanding of that thing based on whatever uh, context they come from. You know, so when you start giving all these people different avenues, like your students came in the other time, you know, they are eating... There's the listening sound. Yeah, we had a wonderful food. Let's, so let's talk about that. I think we have a photo of our dinner. Um, you had an example of different types of food, including African diaspora food. It wasn't just like African countries. Yeah, yeah. So we tried to make sure the food itself is a conversation. You know, that's just throw it in the food. It opens up these avenues of reimagining Africa first. You know, to realize that when you say Africa, we actually involve African diaspora. And then how those cuisines have evolved, you know, they become all these stories. You know, there was yes, chicken, exactly. you know, and, and then they are going, yeah, they are going all the things of resistance and empowerment, you know, yeah. Well, resistance and empowerment come with you having to allow yourself to push against something too, right? We don't yes. sit complacently, even if we're in a society full of diverse communities, we can be, um, isolated in our comfortable privileged shell 
I have friends who lived in Hong Kong for years and never go to the Tatan Tank, which is the local diners, because of the language issue. So, but then there's no excuse. We need to, we need to cross pollinate. And I want to find, you know, leave our last um, couple of minutes here to talk a little bit about that concept of cross pollination. Um, there is a complication to it because it feels like um, some people who are purists feel like we're, we're we're doing something that's disrupting the system. But at the same time cross-pollinating, and I think you embody that, because if you don't mind me going a little more personal now, is you um, and your your wife, you you have a beautiful daughter who is biracial now. And now I don't know if that changes the way you think about how are you going to move forward in, in educating her? What are the languages and cultures and embracing Hong Kong as your home? And how does it all come together? Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely, I think the idea of us, you know, proactively going across cultures, going across ethnic groups um, is very, very important. You know, we can't just let things, you know, I like the idea of self-disrupting as humans. You know, we can't just wait for outside forces to be the one to force change on us. Um, you know, I think it comes to, you know, the parenting aspect. I think for me, what I've discovered is that uh, children are much more confident when they are more familiar with their heritage. So in this particular case, I'm going to make sure she's got the most of the African side. She's got the most of the Japanese side uh, as she's growing up. It's, she's not going to be just half Japanese or half Zimbabwean, half African. She's going to be full Japanese, full African and full Hong Kong as well. So, so, you know, that's the platform that I'm going to give to her. You know, it's up to her later on to decide how she want to go forward. But I think that's the pretty for good foundation for confidence uh, overall. You have to have that talk. You know, like in the state, if you're like, you know, African-American, especially if you have a son, you have to have that talk about how you present yourself. How do you behave in front of the police? How do you, you know, how do you be careful to be not susceptible to violence, which is sad that we have to do that. But how do you feel about that? Living in an Asian country, do you think you need to educate somebody to say, hey, you got to be careful of this and that? I, th I think I probably won't be as paternalistic to say you should be doing it this way, but I think I'll, I'll be able to expose you to the problems so that she understands the issues and then she will make a judgment how she's supposed to feel that about it and experience it. Yeah. I think it's going to be my approach because that way, you know, I, I don't want my biases to carry on over to right. her as well. Right. That's great. Innocent, you know, we're out of tunnel, but this is just kind of like the entrance into thinking about and rebranding blackness by talking about it, by thinking about how we can proactively disrupt those stereotypes. And I really appreciate all that you always have to offer. So we can always continue this conversation. Thank you for all the work you do at the Africa Center. Thank you. I enjoyed it.